This is La Pizarra, a place where we explore creative minds in the entertainment industry on both sides of the mic and the camera. Here is your host, Nikki Mondellini. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of La Pizarra. My name is Nikki Mondellini, and I'm very happy that you're joining us today. I have a very special treat for you. And it's a treat indeed when we talk about his delicious beignets and signature paninis. We will be exploring the creative mind of Chef Pete Blom, or Panini Pete, as many people know him. He has headlined with Guy Fieri on his live road show, performing in 25 plus road shows. And he has also been featured on several Food Network shows, many of them with Guy Fieri, such as Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives, Guy's Grocery Games, Guy's Big Bite, and the Great Food Truck Race with Tyler Florence, as well as CMT's Sweet Home Alabama. Pete has been in the restaurant business for a very long time, and in 2006, he opened Panini Pete's Cafe and Bake Shop in Fairhope, Alabama. And since then, he has been building a restaurant company and hospitality brand that today operates four award-winning establishments on the Gulf Coast. Pete's first book is called Spatula Success, which we will talk about in a moment, and he is a founding member of the Mess Lords, a group of passionate chefs that travel around the world cooking and entertaining American troops. He is also co-founder of the PR Foundation that works to help veterans, adults with disabilities, and no-kill animal shelters. Pete is also the host of the Raw Ingredients Podcast, which delves into the culinary world and all of its wonders. But before we go on with the interview... I would like to remind you that all of the episodes of La Pizarra are available on nikimondolini.com slash podcast, where you can sign up for our monthly newsletter. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts so that others can find us and benefit from the information and the advice that all of our wonderful guests are sharing on each and one of these episodes. Well, and now, without further ado, let's explore the creative mind of Chef Pete Blom. Hey, Pete, how are you doing? Welcome to La Pizarra. Nikki, so glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me and having me on your show. Well, this, this is wonderful because I've been wanting to interview you for a while. You have so much to talk about. I mean, you've built a wonderful, successful business. You started uh, as a teenager and, uh, well, you have your book. So I gave a little bit of that preamble in, in the presentation, but I want you to tell us a little bit about how you got started because you, you weren't really thinking about the food industry as, as a real job, right? For you, at first, it was a summer job when you were a teenager. Yeah, very we're very well read there. You know, you know your stuff, but yeah, you know it was something I did starting at 14 working in the business for a job, for money, you know, if I if I wanted to wear Levi's and Nike's and not Walmart or Kmart, then I had to have money because <laughs> my parents had a budget and then I had to enhance that. So it was great to work and and have some money and I love that aspect of the business. It was hard work, but it was intense and it was social and you know, a lot of people working together. But it was just what I did, you know, and I played sports and I worked on a golf course in the summer in the, you know, grounds crew, mowing, cutting, raking, shoveling. And when I got ready to get out of high school, it was like, what am I going to do now? And I didn't have anything that I was just driven to, you know, I wanted to be a marine biologist and train dolphins when I was a kid, you know, from watching flipper episodes, but that oh, didn't really stick. Flipper, my God, <laughs> that didn't I really that stick. <laughs> and uh, I was I was contemplating joining the service, you know, the the military. And you know, my dad, it was weird because he was kind of against that. Don't call it to the recruiter. And my dad served in the Marine Corps for three years. So I thought he would be pro, but um he's the one that first talked to me about the business as a career. And uh -huh. unfortunately, still to this day, not enough young people think about our industry as a career, you know, because between restaurants, hotels, travel, tourism, you know, I've worked on cruise ships, you know, I've worked in so many, it's, it's so diverse and there's so much opportunity and you can work anywhere in the world you want. And you can also, you know, grow, you know, you can come in entry level, you know, people give you hard knocks, ah, oh, it's hard work and low wages and entry level. It's not the greatest, you know, compared to some trades, if you're going to work in a assembly line or welder around here, things like that. Um, but the sky is the limit. I mean, I know people that have started off as a bellboy and uh, housekeeping. There's a couple in, in Gulf Shores and they have a multi-million dollar hotel company now. So for me, it was when it was presented to me as a career, I said, wow, you know, 
I never thought about that, but I do like it. So that was the taste. That was the start. And, uh, you know, went to, went to a community college to study hospitality management, ended up going to the CIA, got my degree, you know, and, and went to be a culinary school and got a little more specific because I love the back of the house. Um, and my original degree, I did great in the restaurant and the accounting classes, but then when I got the English and speech and your regular core college class, I was like, Bleh, I'm out. <laughs> and well, uh, it just went from there. Let's specify the CIA, not the, the one people think about. <laughs> I'm from the other CIA, the Culinary Institute of America, well, there you which go. was the first CIA, you know, in the 40s. It was the first CIA? You know, wow. Yeah, right yeah. after World War II, they opened in New Haven, Connecticut. And I think in the early 70s, they moved to where they are now in Hyde Park, New York. Amazing facility, amazing school. We have a campus in San Antonio and wow. um, one in Napa Valley and one in uh, Singapore. And that's where you fell in love with just the art of cooking. And you walk through those doors and your life changes forever. Really? And, um, you know, to learn that high level, that foundation of um, real, real cooking, how to build flavor. And then also the business aspect of it. We were exposed to, um, you know, culinary law. We were exposed to um, culinary French, you know, restaurant business, hospitality, uh, supervisory development, a lot of aspects of our industry, as well as table service and formal service. And, and in the mid 80s, when I went there, it was very rooted in classic, you know, there's a lot of old European chefs and everything was, yes, chef, yes, chef, yes, yeah. <laughs> very military as. <laughs> has some of that changed nowadays? You know, do you think it's more relaxed or where has it moved to, you know, with, with all it's, the new It's extremely and- more relaxed. Um, okay. You know, there were aspects of our industry that were tough. And, you know, in the entertainment business, you know, drugs and, and alcohol and things and depression can be really rampant, you know, when you go through these ups and downs. And our industry had a dark side because it was not only permissive and tolerant, almost, you know, com- you know, almost like encouraging some of that in the, in certain environments where it was just work hard and party hard. And that's got a lot better um, the way people run um, kitchens now has gotten a lot better. It wasn't just, you know, fear and intimidation and go. And, um, but the standards have also lowered too. You know, it's so much harder today to get, um, you know, young adults, you know, middle, you know, adults even in their 30s to come in and just be there on time and look sharp and be ready to go and have high standards and, you know, a sense of urgency and understand teamwork. Everything wants to be faster, quicker, you know, I'll oh, just throw it in a pot and heat it up. So, at the school, I'm on the board there, so I still see, um, you know, I go up there at least once a year, and we have different meetings, so I see a lot of what they're doing, and they're really providing a, a high-quality education. The facilities are amazing, um, and the industry is really expanding. Now, they're doing a lot of, uh, you can get four-year degrees there now, wine studies, other things, so in some ways, it's gotten better. In some ways, I think everybody, I think we all agree the world's a little more casual than it used to be. Definitely. Know? Yes. And and when you get, uh, you know, social media and everything else in the mix, uh, I guess, right? You know, you have to be like like quick and fun and quirky to call attention and to promote the restaurants right. and have every everyone go down there, you know. So, yeah. yeah, that's a big challenge these days that you didn't think about when you're young and coming up is you know, because of social media and, um, you know, you have to have a brand, you have to have some brand awareness. If you don't exist on social media, then it's hard to exist in business. Yeah. Yeah. uh, The good good thing is you don't have to be talented. (laughs) You don't have to be good at social media, even though some people are great at it, you know, sometimes just being there and being present and putting, being yourself yeah. Um, is enough to at least keep you in, in their minds, uh, you know, where they, they think about your restaurant when it's time to go eat or whatever. Exactly. And then and then also you get a lot of people sharing their experience at your restaurant. It's like, oh, my God, I just had the best beignets ever like I did when I was oh, there. A few oh, months yes. ago because they're so good. Right. And that's word of mouth. That's you, you put it out there. People from a lot of different states, they'll know about it, you know, and, and that's just amazing. Well, I think that's important too to be aware of in 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 our business when you're doing things, you know, you got to have that well, you know, I completely when we opened Squid Ink, one of one of our properties. So we have five right now, you know, I have Panini Pete's, the original in Fairhope, Sunset Point right up the road, you know, more high end, more seafood. 
We have a new place called the Waterfront in Daphne, which is another big bayfront property with some cool coastal cuisine. We have Ed's Seafood Shed in Spanish Fort, um, classic Southern fried seafood predominantly. And then I have this gastro pub in Mobile called Squid Ink that's really funky. And we just won the most innovative menu in town for the fourth year in a row. And wow, but when I when I went in there, we designed the menu. This was the first restaurant that I went overboard on my budget in plating and plateware. Because, you know, you have all these cool, funky shapes and sizes and earthenware. And then not only are they fragile and they break, but they're expensive. But your food is more Instagram worthy, you know, and you have to think about the, the looks yes. of the drinks and the garnishes. And for years at Panini Pete's, Nikki, as you know, I'm back there, you know, doing everything from scratch and homemade mozzarella, fresh cut fries and home, home you know, um, house roasted meat. So I'm putting all this quality on these paninis, but I'm putting them in a plastic basket with paper and it kind of gets wah, wah, you know, and there's a restaurant down the street that's doing so, so food with China and glass and forks. And everybody's like, well, you know, and I'm like, man, you know, you need to, you need to present your stuff well as, as, as well. Well, yeah, but you know, I'm also a big believer of you can be won over, but by that first bite, right. And People start talking about it and no matter, it can be on newspaper, but if it's really good, people don't care, you know, that's absolutely. I, I mean, the, the flavor has to be there. The quality has to be there. You know, that's, you see Philly cheesesteaks that are like, couldn't get any less casual and there are people wrapped around the building to get this cheesesteak, like you said, wrapped in newspaper, little taquerias, little yeah. food trucks. And, and um, so you're absolutely right there. You got to yeah. back it up with quality. Oh, no, you definitely have to back it up. Uh, tell me now about, you had this wonderful experience uh, of being like from the first time on Triple D, Drive-Ins, Diners and Dives, and um, before the restaurant. So tell us that, I, I think that's a wonderful story, about how Guy Fieri uh, discovered your your first restaurant and then how you started expanding from there. I, I think that's wonderful that that's a lot of... Uh, you know, good things that that coincided, but also a big opportunity that you went with and you knew how to make more of it because not everybody would have the vision to make that grow. So tell us about that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, that's so important for people to realize how many opportunities hit us every day that we just miss. We're just not paying attention to. And I don't mean big, massive things. Could be just a small thing, helping somebody out, you know, answering that phone or that email or cleaning something up, doing sometimes little things that, that don't seem really valuable, but they are, and they lead to additional things. You know, that door that gets you through to get that big part is the 10th door down the way. You know, it, it was one little thing, you know, picking up something for from the post office for somebody and dropping it at an office where you met somebody that led to this, that led to that. So at least that's my philosophy, you know, in my book, yeah. Specialist Success. So when I got that call, first, I thought it was a prank call. I thought it was one of my friends, you know, kid me, I'm getting a call from the Food Network. And, you know, it was, it was kind of like an audition process that I'm sure you're familiar with. You go, you know, it started off with a long interview and then it was basically, you know, we'll call you back in, in four or six weeks or we won't. So yeah. are you going to get a call back or you're not going to get a call back? You know, you know, that's how I relate, you know, cause both uh-huh. of my kids exactly. study musical theater and they're, they're aspiring actors. So I kind of can relate to that. And I tell them all the time, your job is just to be ready and your job is to audition, audition, audition. And maybe once in a while you get a gig. But uh, for me, when I, when I did, it went from a November call till March, till I knew I was going to be on the show. There were four calls about six weeks apart. And, um, you know, then it was like, oh my God, it's a go. And I was so excited. And I, I likened it to, for me, I said, you know, you look what Guy did. He won a show, Next Food Network star. And now he's got this show. Um, you watch American Idol, The Voice, all these things. And you see people get a little opportunity and some do amazing with it. And some don't, and somebody maybe didn't win it, but they were third or fourth. And then how do they take it to the top? So, you know, talent is certainly involved, but it's more than just that because there's more talented people sitting on the couch watching them sometimes, you know, that aren't out there doing it. So I knew right away, I'm like, how do I bring value to what I'm doing? And how do I try to get this small, small bit of exposure to expand to now it's been like 15 years. I just actually got a call Yesterday from the Food Network, I'm going next 
in about a week to go shoot a show up in Tulsa, a new show that guys producing. This is hot. This is hot off the press. All right. A new show they're producing. And um, I got invited to go be a judge on the show. So this is another level up from not just being a competitor or featured chef. Now I'm going to be one of the, one of the judges on the show. So, Oh my goodness. That's amazing. And it's really, it's about that. It's, it's delivering the goods. It's bringing value um, and doing whatever it takes, you know, obviously within reason um to to bring value to what you're doing you know you have talent but there's a lot of other people with talent so what can i do to hustle to revet when i do events with guy and show up and it's a lot of these celebrity chefs or or even worse guys like myself that are you know kind of celebrity chefs regionally and you know been on a lot of national exposure but i don't have my own show or anything well no but so you i see myself as a, a clearly you went on the road with him. You did a lot of things. I mean, know. I've done a lot. I've done a lot. I've traveled the world cooking, you know, for the troops. But um, I still say very modest and humble. And I get in there and roll my sleeves up and work, you know, because our business is, you know, making people happy, putting out good food, helping out. You know, it's washing dishes. It's doing whatever it takes. So I think that's important that you look for those opportunities to go. I'll be there. I'll help. Let's go. And, um, you know, I've tried to teach my kids that, you know, bring value and, you know, it, it's writing little notes. You know, I know whenever he does a production, whether he's a PA or he's doing a gig, he's just finished some uh, theater work. I guarantee you, he's going to have 10 handwritten notes that he's going to give to the producers and the directors and different people and say, thank you for the opportunity. And, you know, let me know if anything I could do. And, you know, and those little difference makers of going, how do you make the most of your opportunity? How do you be somebody they want to work with in the future? Before we go on with the interview, I want to tell you about Squadcast, the platform that I'm using to record most of the episodes of La Pizarra. Besides having excellent sound quality, your guests can join the session from a computer or their mobile device from anywhere in the world. All they need is a stable connection. Squadcast has now joined forces with Descript, the editing platform that generates a transcript while you are editing. Now you can open Descript directly from Squadcast and start editing video and audio right away. Check out all the details at squadcast.fm slash question mark ref equals sign La Pizarra. This super long link is in the show notes. And once you click on it, you can try Squadcast for free for seven days and you can decide which plan best fits your needs. Squadcast has other advantages like the possibility of having up to nine people in a recording session or in a virtual meeting. And you can download your mixed and mastered audio files with Dolby sound quality. Try it out with a link in the show notes. I think that's so important, definitely. And and it's something that you, you mentioned here. Uh, let me read it directly from your book. Okay, hold on, because I have it. I have it here. This is your book, by the way. People who uh, are watching this on YouTube, they can see it. And if not, you can go and watch this on YouTube or go to Pete's um, website. I will, I'm going to link to everything in the show notes, of course. Thank but you, it says, Miss um it says, the little things matter while many of us spend our lives waiting and hoping for the next big break to propel us into the future we're dreaming of. The secret to living a life of abundance is found in the everyday grind. It's the seemingly small decisions and actions that multiplied over time lay the solid, lay solid foundation for building a successful and fulfilling life. There it is right there. That could have been a lot shorter book if I just condensed it. Well, no, because it's a book. It's okay in a book. Yeah. It has to be long. But that's so true. You know, it's happened to me so many times. Like, I, I think I referenced that in the book, standing on the deck of an aircraft carrier in the middle of the Arabian Sea, oh watching God. jets launch. And yes. I'm on this massive, you know, ship for three days with some of my chef buddies. And we're doing tens of thousands of meals and just having a blast and going, how the hell did I get here? And, you know, getting that call yesterday from the Food Network to do another show. And you're like, it's it's this massive foundation that's that from taking massive action on little things. For me, it's it's just all these thousand little decisions and these little good deeds and these little times when you went over and you worked hard and you tried to be prepared and you went in early or you stayed late or you volunteered over here. And they just eventually you get old and you got so many of those things that it builds up a foundation. So it's good stuff. Yeah. And you've done enough good things to to go around. And I like your motto: it's dig deep, work hard, do good things. Right? Not Absolutely. everybody follows that. It's like you, you know, you reach 
success and you're good and you just think, okay, I'll, I'll keep working hard to maintain that success. But if you also turn around and look at all the people that have helped you and you try to give back, you know, just help out or whatever, just keep an open mind and, and an open heart, I would say, to mm-hmm. keep things growing. And, and that brings success for everybody, right? Not just for yourself. Yeah. As you grow, you realize I have another quote that um, I think it's my quote. I wasn't able to find it anywhere. So I think I'm the first one to do it. I'm trying to tag it. But I say now, don't just work to make a living, work to make a difference. And I think if you do that, it's just, it's proven to me to just, it, it, it gives you so much more opportunities and you feel better. Obviously you're doing good things and uh, it's harder as we grow. You know, I started with this grinding and, you know, working in all these restaurants and working for other people and eventually getting my own shop and really working hard and going all in and going broke before we made money. And, you know, now it's this multi-million dollar company and real estate and and other things that I'm doing and the the Food Network stuff. And it's crazy to think about it, but I'm still the same guy. I have a different role I play now, um, but I still love to get out there and just have fun and do things and, you know, get in there and working with the crew, working with the customers um, yeah, and you are the face of your company. If if you're out there greeting people and you're present and you're helping and all that, it's it just goes to show the quality of the of the business that you have been building. You're not someone that is unreachable and that is just you know said a few things and then brought in a bunch of people to keep doing your work and you're st- standing in the right. background. No, you're you actually are there and you keep creating and. In reinventing things, you know, right now you open the the waterfront. Is you, you said that's your fifth restaurant around yeah, there, right? Yes, or six? Oh, is it fifth or six? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, and then we have yeah. a food hall we're working on right now in Mobile. That'll be six. That'll be open in the fall. Oh my gosh! Wow. Because I was going to ask you what's <laughs> three new next, brands. What's your next thing? But you just keep bringing up all these things. It's it's amazing to see you. You keep growing and and getting all these uh, ideas. You know, so. um so that is the next one. And uh, so how has the waterfront uh, been going? That's the one that you recently opened. Yeah, waterfront's been phenomenal. So it's 7,000 square foot right on the bay. Amazing view. You look across the bay, you see the skyline of Mobile, big deck. We covered it uh, with a nice roof covering and fans and misters. And, you know, we took some cues from, you know, the name, the waterfront. So I wanted to feature some cool, iconic dishes that we have that people expect but also to be able to bring in other dishes from maybe a, a Northeastern spin on a lobster roll or a play on Peruvian ceviche or a play with Argentinian shrimp and be able to bring in other ingredients and other techniques from iconic waterfronts. Where here, sometimes people tend to go, oh, you know, you're selling salmon or you're selling this and that's not a Gulf fish. They, they want you to be a purist, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, you're just missing out. So like I, I, rolled that into the to the concept and say this is iconic waterfront inspiration from all over the globe you know so we have some caribbean stuff and just little hints and little playing around with that stuff but it's been very good very well received um we're doing a lot of parties there now we had a huge bash guy was in town filming some triple d i just co-hosted an episode with him and did some cameos and another so those will be airing later this year and that was a blast and and we ended up hosting a big party at the waterfront with this band from New Orleans called Cowboy Mouth. And, and it was, it was just crazy. We had about 350 people in there just going bananas. And, My um, so it's gotten a great send off and, and everybody's excited about it. So we're, we're, it, I think it has the potential within a couple of years to probably be our highest volume restaurant. Wow. Oh my goodness. And that's hard because Sunset that- Point is pretty lethal. Sunset Point's a busy, yes. busy place. I still have to go to that one. Been to Panini Pete's, just had you know delicious beignets and paninis there. Yes, uh, yes. But I have to, I have to, and I've had uh, the, the smoothie because you also mm-hmm. have that smoothie and, and juice uh, place right next to Panini's. Right, and what we just did on that too. What I ended up doing, I was kind of fighting with myself. So there's a little area we call the Fairhope French Quarter where Panini Pete's is. We've been there 18 years. 19 years and, and a shop went out and there was a place that came available and I kind of was, all right, we'll get it. And we opened up this juice bar um, 
and f- kind of tried to do a little fruteria as well. I didn't, everybody didn't really get that in Alabama, but it's been fun. But I was fighting with myself there too. And cause I didn't want people coming in, getting tables in the patio to just have smoothies because that's the restaurant turf. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe they can order one, but how are we going to do that? It's a different model. You know, it's a different register, a different business. So I kind of fought with myself for a few months on that. And what we ended up doing recently was basically I absorbed that brand into Panini Pete's. Uh So it's Panini Pete's featuring Fairhope Squeeze. And Uh so now it's on our menu. It's part of our product lineup. What I did was I I gave up that spot and I just incorporated it into our bar to make that a coffee bar and smoothie bar so we could bring in another merchant in there. And it's just like, it, I was like, no brainer, you know, so it's just expanding our offerings instead of kind of fighting with myself. So now I love to see smoothies and juices out on the tables and, you know, okay. coffee drinks. And so it's really cool. And that's the thing with business and your career is, you know, you got to be smart enough to keep your ego out of the way and do what's right, you know, for the business. And where I was, the place I was just talking about, Squid Ink, is in a former location of a Panini Pete's. So, you know, Panini Pete's was my OG. That's what I started with. Six years into it, I opened up my second one in in Mobile. And that was a great business lunch market. We It was one of those downtowns that had gone south that was coming back. We had 20,000 people every day that would come down and work and then leave at five o'clock. So breakfast and lunch made sense. The weekends were really mediocre. You had kids coming down there drinking Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So that market started to evolve. People started moving in. And, you know, a couple of restaurants popping up, you know, a better clientele. And I was like, huh, I need to do something about this. And we converted Pete's to Squid Ink. You know, I owned the property there. So it was an easy um, decision to go. I want to keep this. And I could figure out a way to do Panini Pete's later. And, you know, for a lot of people, they're like, what happened to Panini Pete's? I thought it was busy. You know, oh, he closed. He's closing a restaurant. And it's, you know, not only is it the name of the restaurant, it kind of became my identity. You know, hey, there's Panini Pete. So I had to completely not worry about the ego of it and go, this is a business decision. I want to do a fun, funky gastro pub with lunch, dinner, cocktails. And we're literally doing five times the business in this squid ink that we were at Panini Pete. So it was a great decision. Wow. And, and the accolades, you know, with the food and what we're doing there is great. So, but the food hall around the corner we're getting ready to do is going to be the return of Panini Pete's to Mobile as well. So Panini Pete's will anchor the food hall. Oh, okay. Okay. So it will be there anyway. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great because I mean, you, you already started all of that and, and people will remember it. And so you, you've got a great uh, thing going on that, that it won't be as hard to start because you already had all that, you know, yeah, we've, got, we've got a good about. following there and, you know, play on your successes, go deep on, on what you're good at and, but always look to expand and keep, keep yourself in check and understand what the market, you know, a a lot of young chefs that I'll consult with and talk. And one of the first things I talk to them about is cooking for your customer's ego. You know, you got to have an identity and you got to have your standards. You don't just want to sell out. Um, But, you know, you can't just say, you don't get me, you don't understand my food or you don't understand my art or whatever it is. Well, they don't understand it. You know, you're you're not going to make a living. So you got to be able to, you know, play to the audience as well. Hey, let's talk about your podcast, The Raw Materials. When did that come about? Yeah, yeah. So we do this. It's the raw ingredients, actually. Oh, you know, sorry. Yeah, the raw the ingredients. The raw materials. Like, you know, sorry. Ingredients of a recipe. And it's so funny because literally it started, God, eight years ago. Uh, my business partner, Nick, was pushing me to do a radio show locally. And I really didn't want to. And And one of my buddies, Keith, who we now have a publishing and, and uh, production company, he was talking to me about a podcast. And I'm like, what is a podcast? He's like, well, you can do it anywhere you want. He goes, you're going to do a radio show, really? Every Tuesday night at seven or whatever, you're going to be there in Mobile. He's like, you know better than that. That's not going to happen. So he f- he was the first one that talked to me about it. And he says, you own it. And I really didn't understand it. I bought some gear and I said, you know, I'm, I'm deep with the mess lords. I'm doing all this fun stuff. I'm traveling the world. I'm cooking with these chefs. I'm in these exotic places. I'm building a business. I could just do these recording things and you just put it out there. And that's kind of what I did. And some of them were fun and funny and we were drinking and kind of goofy. And then some of it, at some point I kind of went, you know, if I'm going to keep doing this, I want to bring value. 
um, because I'm not the level of celebrity that people just can't wait to tune in and hear me and other chucklehead chefs doing crazy things around the world. You know, it's interesting, but it's not that interesting <laughs> for not for an hour or more. So I decided to evolve it. It was originally, I just called it hot off the press podcast, which I thought was brilliant, you know, panini press and I press sandwiches and everybody's going to get it. But I was like, eh, I don't even, I'm changing the name. So I rebranded it to the raw ingredients. And I talk about what are your raw ingredients or what's your recipe for success? And I mostly interview restaurateurs and chefs, but I've also done some athletes and some business people. And I love it because like you is doing a podcast, you know, being the interviewer and listening, it's amazing how much you learn and um, not just about business and opportunity success, but about the people that you think, you know, you know, you're like going, Oh my God, you know what? I can't believe I didn't even know they did this or they did that. Um, and just hearing their story, hearing their origin story, it's just really, really cool. So I love it. I'm getting ready to start recording a new season. Um, and it's just been great. It's been a lot of fun and it's good for it's branding. It's a lot of things that, you know, people out there need to realize that, man, if you're going to do it, go for it. Now, do you think you're going to make a bunch of money on it? You can, maybe I don't do it for that. Um, initially because of the brand that we have, it helps to fuel that and it helps with exposure. And for me, I just love it. I consume podcasts and when I'm interviewing somebody, I'm, you know, drinking all that in as well. And that is um, on your website mainly, or you're on all major platforms. Yeah, it's on it's on all the major platforms as well. You know, I have a link on my website, chefpanitipete.com, and I typically share that and direct people there because that's got more of my story and you know branding and all that other stuff. So, um, but it's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcast, it's on those all those little platforms as well. Perfect, perfect. Um, what would you say has been like one of your toughest obstacles to overcome since you started with with all of your business? I'll tell you, there's there's a lot. You know, funding is huge. A lot of people get into it, and one, they don't realize um, that it takes money to be successful. I I talk to chefs, and and they go, you know, I'm going to open this place, and it's going to be great, and I'm going to do five within the next three years, and they haven't even opened the first one yet. You know, I mentioned earlier, it was six years after I opened my first one until I did my second one. Um, so, you know, don't think right away, back into it and go, what do I want to make? You know, from a, what's the minimum I want to make if you're going to go open your own business and then back into it and go, what are all my expenses? Cause you know, you have your fixed expenses are crazy. You don't realize rent and insurance and linen and um, music, you know, rights and all these different things that you're paying for. And then all the people you pay for, the whole pyramid gets inverted and everybody gets paid till you get to just the very, very bottom. And um, if there's anything left, you get it. So that's one of the toughest things. And I continued to go all in um, to grow my business. So, you know, it was a long time before I started making what I felt like was was really good money because when I went my second one, okay, now I have these key employees that I have to raise up to and a manager and a sous chef. So I've got to pay them salary. So I'm making a little money now, boom, I got to step back and I got to be willing to sacrifice some of that to grow. So money's a big thing and realizing that you're probably going to have to make a lot of sacrifices. Um, and then obviously depending on the career, you know, there's challenges with us as we're a very labor intensive industry. So when you look at tech and how many people and, you know, each, individual can generate 350,000, 600,000 in revenue, whatever. You get into our business and it's like $30,000 worth of revenue per person. It's just crazy labor intensive. So you have to have a lot of people involved. You're constantly training. It's a it's a stepping stone career. It's not a career for everybody. It's a job. So you do have turnover. You know, if you get somebody, we do really good, but you know, still if you have somebody for a year or two, then you're doing great. You know, there's a lot of places that constantly are understaffed. Um, location is important. The food, the food chain, you know, the food supply chain has been crazy for us in our industry because everything's gone up and things have been harder to get. Um, and then keeping yourself, your priorities right. You hit these breakpoints in, in your career when you get to a certain level and it's hard to break through, you know, and you're going, oh, I'm just struggling. And you have to look around and go, okay, what do I need to do to get past this speed bump? And, you know, whether it's, training you need, whether it's somebody else you need to bring on the team, whether it's a level of technology, whether it's a discipline, you know, in, in your careers, you know, in entertainment, you know, it could be 
I mean, everything, you know, like I talk to my son, your job every day is play the, play the keyboard, play the ukulele, sing, do accents, work out. I don't know. But to me, I think like you need to be prepared. So what is it that you're doing? I mean, you're one of these phenomenal voiceover artists right now. How long, how many years ago was it that that was not even on your radar? Yeah, exactly. Not before 2006. Yeah. So you, so you got to adapt. And I think that's important is keeping your finger on the pulse, adapting, getting mentors um, so that people can help you through that. Because, you know, whether it's money, whether it's opportunity, um, learning what you can learn to uh, to grow your business. For me, it was transitioning also into going, oh, if I could be the landlord and I can acquire the real estate as well, I have something for my retirement. So the Squid Ink building, I bought that kind of on a wing and a prayer. And, um, you know, it was funny because... The, there was a lady that owned a restaurant there and she was getting ready to retire. And, you know, so now she gets this payoff. I buy the building. She gets the money. She didn't own her finance. And she's like, this is my retirement. And I'm like, great. I hope it does the same thing for me that it did for you. Well, in the meantime, now I've learned the business of real estate. So not just as a chef in a restaurant tour that goes, when I'm ready to hang up my hat, maybe I can sell the business and still be the landlord. Or maybe I can sell the building and get a chunk of money. That's my retirement. Where now I've learned that the power of using real estate as a business too. So now it's already an income generating property and I'm learning how to manage that and how to leverage that to, to go deeper and to go, man, we're going to open new restaurants, but I'm also diversified into these other businesses that come up, whether it's writing a book, doing a podcast, mm -hmm. you know, things, things happen, man, when you're paying attention. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. Well, it's it's just wonderful to hear how you have been building your business and paying attention and just making it grow and taking advantage of the opportunities. You know, I think that's one of the biggest things that people can take away uh, from this interview, as well as all the other jewels and bits of uh, golden nugget advice that you've given. And uh, I'm going to put a link, of course, to your website where they can get your book and everything. Um so what is, okay, this is going to be a bit tricky because of course you <laughs> do many, many delicious things, but if you should say, or if you had to pick one of your favorite cuisines and then your favorite dish, I'm going to put you, I'm going to, you know, ask both. I know it's hard, I mean, but you put it up there. That's, that's an easy one and a hard one. Okay. I mean, cuisine, I love Italian food the best. I don't even have to think twice about it. Italian is my favorite. You know, it's all about ingredients. You know, there's, there's a lot of technique involved in any any kind of business you have, or especially whether it's sports, whether it's music, whether it's cooking, whether it's acting, you know, there's technique. So, but then there's some cuisines that it's so heavy laden with technique, um, like in some French dishes and whatnot, or Japanese and Asian where with Italian, you know, it's great ingredients and don't screw them up. And some of the best Italian food I've ever eaten, maybe three or four, you know, ingredients. Um, now there is high level cooking especially, you know, go to Italy. and But just when you have the prosciutto di Parma and the Parmigian Reggiano and all these amazing dishes, yes. um, as you know, awesome. with your heritage, um, I love it. That's my favorite. Now, you know, as far as my favorite dish, that's one's like impossible. I mean, it's like today, what's my favorite dish? Next week, what's my favorite dish? There's so many great meals that you have that not only are they delicious, but they take you somewhere. It's like a song, you know, that reminds you of that place yeah. and that time. And it just transitions. Food's so powerful. You know, we have it for birthdays and weddings and, and funerals and, you know, any kind of anniversaries, you know, food is yeah. a big part of it. And then food and brings people together, you know, a hundred percent. So it, it's tradition, very social. It's just such an important part of a family tradition of, of a country, right? You know, you have your typical mm -hmm. dishes and all that. Okay. So I'll, I'll modify the question and <laughs> let you off the hook a Peanut little Peanut butter bit. jelly sandwich. That's what I eat more than anything. It's still my favorite. I got, I got okay. the tattoo, the PB and J right here. <laughs> really? Oh my God. Look at that. Okay. Yeah. You, you have to tell a story about all of your tattoos sometime because yeah, <laughs> yes, you have plenty of them. Okay. Now, so what is the first dish that you created? Maybe when you were at the CIA, when you realized, oh, I have a talent for this. This is delicious. You know, something that was like a <sighs> eureka moment for you. Yeah, I think, it. you know, I don't know if I could pinpoint the exact dish, but, you know, there were certain times when it wasn't like I have a knack for it, but it was, you know, you just felt like suddenly, you know, some of the 
windows were opening and some of the mystery was being unlocked when you were starting to learn to develop flavor. And you kind of did it accidentally. You know, you heard these chefs, you know, when I was in school, prior to going to school, I was working in restaurants and, you know, shucking oysters and frying chicken and having fun and doing good things and putting out what I felt like was good food. I worked in a great restaurant in South Florida called 15th Street Fisheries when I was in high school. And I still, I was there last time I was in Fort Lauderdale, a couple of weeks ago, I went by the fisheries to eat. Um, the owner who has since passed away was the president of the restaurant association. He was a professor in hospitality, big mentor in my career. So there's a lot of things these windows open up. And I, I remember we were doing this ale braid. We were doing this sirloin steak that was herb roasted and seared with this ale and onion sauce. And it was really, a you know, close to graduation at the CIA. And I was just like, man, this is really so good. And it just came out so right. And we were working. We spent a week in that restaurant working out front and a week in the back. And then we moved on to the next class. And it was, I was making this dish every day going, man, this is one of my new favorites. And just the contrast of the sauce with the sear of the meat and learning how to develop flavor. Um, that was a big one for me that stands out, you know, that I remember because it was so much stuff we cooked. It's making a simple omelet. I could remember doing a French omelet and getting in trouble, you know, because we were, when you had pantry cooking, you were cooking breakfast for the school. So you're learning pantry and you're learning breakfast cooking and all this stuff. Well, any that it was a self-sustained school. So you had all these different classes doing all this different stuff and you always fed yourself. And then a lot of times if somebody was in a service class, they may have been assigned to eat in there um, or if they were in a tech class. So pantry cooking was all about, we cooked breakfast for the whole school. So we're in there doing our stuff and and the chef didn't like me too much. I was a little bit of a wise guy, <laughs> but I worked hard and I showed up and I remember every omelet going through there. I was like, man, this is beautiful. Oh my God, look at that one. Make sure you sell the chef. He's over there on the chef table and I'm talking loud enough where he can hear me and I'm telling these kids that I'm doing these beautiful omelets and he, he, did, he was pissed off. He was like, you need to just shut up, man. You don't even know how to cook, man. Stop. <laughs> but um, I make a pretty good omelet. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, you do. And pretty good beignets and paninis and other things. I mean, you, you just have evolved into so many different things. And well, if, if this episode is not making people hungry, I don't know what will. But, <laughs> go, but, eat. Yeah, go, go, go eat. Yeah, go eat. <laughs> to a good restaurant and and, uh, and thank the chef and your servers. And uh, right. And 100%. Just be, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Pete, this has been such a hoot. I mean, I've enjoyed talking to you so much. Thank you for, for coming on the show and, and, uh, you know, just uh, sharing your, your experiences, your growth and all your wealth of advice, because I think, um, several things that you have said here can be applied definitely to any career, you know, creative careers or anything. But the, the most important thing is to, to, uh, do that, you know, work hard, but also giving back and, and, and watch Absolutely. things multiply. I think that's the best type of advice. And what, what else would you like um, people to, to learn from this? And maybe also uh, people who have been thinking about going into the restaurant business, uh, what would be your advice? Okay. Yeah. I mean, first of all, thank you for having me, Nikki. It was great. And, you know, people look me up on Instagram, Chef Panini Pete, Facebook, and chefpaninipete.com because, you know, scratch on the surface. If you want to go deeper and, you know, order the book, learn more about that or, or think, see more about my philosophy or what we do with the PR Foundation and the Mess Lords. And there's so many things that, that I'm into um, and dig deeper because, you know, it's all been done before, but sometimes you hear something that just resonates. Sometimes somebody says it in a way that just makes sense and it helps to inspire or trigger you to, to either get over that barrier you had, which may be just getting up out of bed on time and going. You know, there's the barriers are either financial, they could be physical, they could be mental, you know, so dig deep into that stuff, find out more that you can. And if restaurant, if you're thinking about getting in the restaurant business, you better go work in a restaurant first and make sure because it's not glamorous. I mean, to me it is, I love it. I couldn't do anything else, but it's not TV. You know, Food Network is a blessing and a curse. I've been on a bunch of Food Network. I love it. It's been crazy for our industry, but it's also, you know, a lot of people watch that and go, Ooh, I want to have a cupcake shop. And they show up and they go, yeah, I'm a chef and go, okay, great. Where have you cooked at? Well, I grew up watching the Food Network and, you know, they're 18 years old and they're calling themselves a chef and they really don't know what they're doing and they don't know the industry because it's not doing little composed dishes for your family. 
it's going, okay, we are going to cook this like beignets, you know, this is great. And you're going to make this dough and you're going to learn this, but now I need, we're going to make 800 of those today in the next two hours, you know, or whatever. And you're like, whoa, man. So production, the intensity, you either love it or you hate it, you know? Um, so get out and work in a restaurant. And if you've been working in a restaurant and you're thinking you're ready to make the transition, you know, find a mentor, find people that are doing a good job or go work with people that you know are doing a good job, that run good operations, that have standards, that have um, systems in place. You know, you can't just go fly off the seat of your pants. As you grow and scale, one of the things that you're going to run up against is inconsistencies. So if you don't develop systems or when I walk in a restaurant, I can see if the lighting's right, the sound's right, the shades are all at the same level, the bathroom's cleaned, you know, everybody's looking sharp and uniform and tucked up. And there's all these little things your brain's just taking into them. And to create that takes standards. You have to have systems in place to develop these young managers and these young leaders into rock stars. So, yeah, absolutely. It's so all those beware. details. Yeah, beware and, and just really. <laughs> Think hard and, and do it the right way and don't be afraid to start at the entry level and take your time because it all takes time to develop. Yeah, be patient. I think that's that's a, a great point there because a lot of people look at what I'm doing now and don't realize I didn't open my first business till I was 42 years old. So a lot of people get patient. They're not a millionaire and they're 28 and they're going, oh my God, I want to be a waitress or cook my whole life. I'm like, no, but you know, you have to evolve, but it takes time. Yeah, absolutely. But, well, but thank you so much for having me, girl. No, it's well. Thank you. Thanks again. And uh, as I said, I'm going to put all the, the links in the show notes. And uh, well, I wish you much success with with the waterfront uh, continued success. When with with the other one that you're thinking about opening the sixth one. I mean, just everything that's going on. And do keep us informed about that that new show that you're talking about because uh, yeah, that way we can yes. I can follow yes, up yes. on our newsletter and of course people when you when they follow you on Instagram, you know them they'll, they'll get the scoop and and be able to watch that new show. Yeah, there'll be some updates. So I'm filming on the 10th. I don't even want to say the name, the working title. It's probably, you know, we're probably just shooting a pilot. They might be shooting typically, as you know, maybe a six episode and see what happens from there. Um, but um, yeah, I'm excited because it's the next level for me of not just being, you know, I've done a bunch of grocery. I've done over 20 shows on the Food Network, but now I'm like, quote unquote, one of the experts, you know, so that's really cool. That is really cool. My God, congratulations for that. <laughs> I couldn't have gotten a better judge as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> oh, I, I, I can be judgmental. I can be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know your stuff, right? So yeah, they, they better, because I mean, you you know the ingredients. I mean, you you know everything that goes into it. You know the right point and uh, when things really are good. I mean, you, you have that criteria. So um, yes, you, you're going to be a very good judge. Pete, thanks again. And um, as I said, congratulations Bravo. on all the new ventures. Thank you. Say hey to everybody. Thanks, Nikki. I will. I Appreciate will. you. Thanks for joining us on La Pizarra. Want to listen to more episodes? Visit lapizarrapodcast.com or nikimondelini.com slash lapizarra, where you can sign up for our newsletter and get exclusive previews of future episodes, as well as resources for your creative business. Tune in next week for another interesting interview.